everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Crime and Coffee Couple. My name's Allison. And my name's Mike. Hi, Mike. Hey, how are you? I'm doing just fine this morning. How are you? Good, good. You got yourself on another cute little onesie. Huh? I do. This is my orange one. Oh, you got two of them. Mm-hmm. Must be nice. It is nice. It's yeah. very comfortable for the weekend. One of my coworkers that um, listened to our show, uh, she was like, oh, I got to get one of those onesies and support you guys. I'm like, oh, actually, there's no support. We don't get any commission on that one. So You're just supporting Dick Sporting Goods and FP Movement. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to get the link, that's in the last show. But just, yeah, we like to share things if they work for us. We share them with our listeners. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, how's how's life been for you? It's been good. You know, business you as sure usual. You'd say that? Are you sure you'd say life's um, been good? You know, I've had some moments. Yeah. Of just being a little too overwhelmed. Yeah, because I've been uh, on work things quite a bit. Lots of traveling for recently. Mike, which, yeah. um, you know, the, our kids are fantastic. It's just the act, after school activities that are just tiresome. And you're the type of person that likes to plan ahead and know that you have enough time for everything. And if you don't, if you're the one that's responsible for absolutely everything in the house, usually I can pick up, you know, a good portion of it. But, you know, if I'm not even here, you're like, how am I going to fit in all these things? Like, especially like, you know, research for the podcast right. and just your everyday life that takes, you know, you like to have the house in a certain way. Literally, folks, anybody can come over almost at any time and the house is fully put together and picked up. Well, if you keep it that way, it's easier because you're never really cleaning up. If you're just using things and putting them away, wiping things up as you go, your house is never really a shit show. If you the whistle while time, you work, it makes it much, much, much merrier. Much nicer. Yeah. So the only time our house is a shit show is if I get sick or go out of town. <laughs> when you get sick, you get out of bed and you're just like, oh no, I got so much work ahead of me. It's usually if I go on a girl's trip for a weekend, it takes me about four days to get the house back to where I live. Like it. Oh yeah, I I see. I don't have that in my brain where it's like, oh, must like you know, stay ahead of the game. I, I keep the dishes clean, and yeah, I might do a vacuum once, but mm-hmm. um, no, probably. I not. don't think so. No. no. Okay. Um, the kids are surviving when I'm out of town, and you know, the they, house is okay. Yeah, they survive. The house is just still not alive. to my standards. Right, right. Well, your standards are very high. They are. That's okay. So, um, I've said it before. I'm a little neurotic. Okay, this yeah. is me. Uh, I got to go on business. So one of the best things about my business trips, you know, it sucks leaving the family, but the best thing in my opinion is getting to eat wherever I want for the most part. Cause I get like, mm-hmm. you know, 75 bucks a day basically. And I eat really stingy on like breakfast and lunch. So I could have a decent dinner. And now that I'm not drinking, it's like most of that 75 can go towards the meal. Well, let's call a spade a spade. Alcohol at a restaurant is close to the same price as an entree. Yeah. And luckily our company will allow alcohol you know, in moderation, but it's like, you still got to stay under your limit. Right. So, it's like, hmm, now I went to Capitol Grill for the first time. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I've ever been to Capitol Grill, but I've heard good things about it. They have like a lobster mac and cheese. That's the only thing I think about every time somebody talks about it. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to eat right. And I go there with a coworker and I'm like, I don't, I, I don't know if I can get the lobster mac and cheese. I just know it's going to be awesome and cheesy and delicious. Decadent as hell. Yeah. I'm like, maybe I should just go to get the Brussels sprouts. And he's like, well, I'm lactose intolerant, so that's good. I can't share it with you because they're all shareables. Okay. And I'm yeah. like, okay, well, that makes it easier. We can get like Brussels sprouts. And so we order our steaks or whatever. And uh, I'm like, all right, well, Brussels sprouts. And then he's like, well, unless you want to do a lobster mac. I'm like, I thought you were lactose intolerant. He's like, I have pills. Oh, I was going to say, just pop a lactose pill. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, you didn't tell me that. He's <clears throat> he's popping pills for the, the dinner. Yeah. So last second i'm like all right let's do lobster mac and cheese and it was fantastic you didn't so. tell me about that yeah well i want to save it for the podcast get the real reaction so there wow, it was that sounds amazing yeah. so it was all that it's cracked up to be oh it was wonderful and the service like phenomenal the dude was super cool like not one of the stuffy places he's mm-hmm. like yeah guys take your time or whatever and like you know i i always get nervous when they don't like try to write down what you order and there was only two of us so it was easy but yeah it, fantastic through and through what gets me great. at restaurants is when they're at your table every 30 seconds like you ready yet how about now how about now it's like you literally just turned and walked away no i'm not done especially when you're catching up with people you haven't seen in a long time like when we went and met up with our friends from chicago we haven't seen them in probably a couple years well that's it's got to be annoying to servers you know that are are waiting to get your order and you know turn your table but at the same time i'm here probably paying a premium to to have my meal here so let us have a little time you know what they should do they should install like a little button on your table that notifies her tablet or something that this table is ready to order his or her his or her whoever i don't care but that way they're not continuously wondering they know 
well. Or there. Wouldn't that make sense? Yeah, I agree. Like kind of like when you go to those Brazilian steakhouses, you turn over the green thing, and they're like, "Yeah, bring me more meat, mm-hmm. sausage." It's like no sausage. I know that's cheap. Just keep the sausage away. I want steak. I want pork chop or not not pork chops because pork's cheap. I want lamb chops. Yeah. So lamb, beef. That's what we're talking about. Keep the chicken the hell out of here. I can make chicken at home. That's what I want. Lamb and beef when I go. So to you know, Mike says that I plan out our whole life. He plans out his Brazilian steakhouse. He looks up like price per pound of meat. Okay. Uh, nope. No chicken on that. It's too cheap per pound. Uh, the same thing <laughs> at buffets also. So if I go to a buffet, I'm hitting seafood hard. Yeah. Like not the fake crab with a K, but I'm hitting salmon. Um, I'm not going to have cream cheese. I know that shit's cheap because they put it in all the sushi. Right. I try to hit them hard where it, where it hurts. Where it hurts. Yeah. And like, I, it's probably better for me too because it's expensive. So, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. When shrimp. Oh, man. The big shrimp. Not those little guys. The colossals. Oh, man. I could kill some shrimp. <laughs> So, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, let's keep it moving here, Mike. Yeah, we're, on, we are, we're on business here. Exactly. Exactly. We want to. We have these listeners that are, are coming at us. And thank you so much for listening. We appreciate it, folks. Um, maybe if I can find... What, which way so, are you I was iPad? watching Curb Your Enthusiasm, speaking of restaurants, and he, Larry David was making a restaurant, and his idea to get the waitress over was to ring a bell. Ah. See, that's too intrusive. That's kind of like, yeah, like they're your server. I mean, they are your server. I, that's yeah, why I don't but like that's that word. Too, but... I don't like that. No. Well, not to mention it's distracting for the people around you my my friend one thing uh, when we want to leave and if the waitress or waiter or whatever is not there and you, you want your your check or something uh he always stands up and he just looks around and be like okay well put your hand in your pockets like it's okay like, <laughs> i know i was always like sit down it's uncomfortable but it gets their attention every I know, time especially he was he's a tall guy so yeah, yeah. so i'm is the same height so he seems i don't know he seems taller than yeah you. okay okay thanks allison <laughs> anyways hey um if uh, if you like our show and you know maybe you don't have some money you're not a patron that's fine don't worry about it um, or you don't like us enough to be a patron, that's fine too. Maybe um, you hate us. No, you're probably not listening if you hate us. And good riddance, I don't give a shit. So, oh, wow, did I just say that? Wow, you're harsh. Hey, well, well hey, our Crime and Coffee Club, Coffee Club Club, it, you know, it's they're, they're near and dear. They're near and dear to us. Exclusive club. So uh, if you love us and uh, you want to you know, support us without having to pay anything, go ahead and leave us a review on whatever podcast platform you can, whether it's five stars. But here's a review by Josie. She said, you guys are awesome. I love how you choose cases that aren't well known and used in other podcasts. Love your voices. I'm picky when it comes to my podcasters. Thank you, uh, guys, for the amazing content. Aw, very sweet. So, I love that name, Josie. Yeah, that's a great name. And uh, but yeah, I, I I hate my voice. Every time I hear it, I'm like, eh, I sound like a nasally Oh, jerk. you don't. Oh. I'm the one that has the annoying talk. I think it's beautiful, and I love your talk. Well, I appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So if you're ready to go, I know I am. Okay, let's do it. I was born it. ready. You're born ready. So this is a very sad story, as most are. Um, This is the murder of Kim Wall. And when I say most, all. So this story is a listener suggestion from Elena. So thank you so much, Elena. Uh, and if you have a suggestion, go ahead on Instagram or Patreon or um, any of those platforms. Uh, TikTok is hard because we have a lot of followers. It sounds like a humble brag, but it's not. But it's, uh, yeah, Instagram's probably the best in my opinion. Yeah, and we do, um, Mike sends them all my way and then I put them on my Pinterest. That's, that's my method. So I do appreciate each and every one of them. So 30-year-old Kim Wall was a freelance journalist. She was traveling the world. She was really living her best life at this point in time. She was from Sweden, but she had previously done reporting from North Korea, the South Pacific, Uganda, Cuba, Kenya, New York City, the Marshall Islands, Haiti. She had been everywhere. That's pretty amazing. Yes. And she had written for Harper's, Time, the New York Times, The Guardian, Vice, the South China Morning Post, among other publications. And I was thinking about this career path. I mean, it's got to be very challenging, but so exciting. I love the idea of a job that's not a nine to five. I cannot stand. I'm a very efficient worker and I'm not just like tooting my own horn. I've been doing my job for many, many years. Like I say to our listeners, you're very, if you like our show, you're very lucky to like it because Allison's working her ass off for anything she does in her life. So that's, it's absolutely true. You would be great at anything you put your mind to. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much. So that really does mean a lot to me. Um, but I do. I'm, I'm always trying to look at efficiency and, and be faster. So oftentimes I'm done with my job, my nine to five job earlier than typical. And it's like sometimes I have this like need to just sit there because somebody might expect me to. And I'm like, this is just asinine. So I think jobs like this are so fantastic because number one, she's seeing the world. She's writing for all these stories or like her creation most of the time. It's, it's just awesome. 
but it's got to be exceptionally challenging because you have to be self-driven. You have to put yourself out there. You have to put yourself in potentially dangerous situations. And pushy too, if you want to get some good information. Yes. I mean, it's not just readily available. It's like you got to talk to the right people and just introduce yourself and be like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm from this station or whatever it is. And I'm the, this editor for this story. And here we go. Yeah, yeah. I need this information. And she was freelance. So she was, she was working for herself. And so obviously Kim must have been a very strong, long-willed, hardworking, dedicated person. So that's why I'm putting it out there. Obviously, I don't know Kim, but this is just from the things that I read. I imagine that she was a very strong person. So her writing had been translated into several languages. Kim specialized in stories about identity, gender, pop culture, subcultures, often with social justice themes. It was August of 2017 when the story took place. Kim was getting ready to move to Beijing, China with her Danish partner, Ole Staub. Staube is how you pronounce it. And it was interesting for me because this is this takes place in Denmark. So I had to do some, you know, translations. Um, so in March of 2017, Kim had heard about a 46-year-old Danish inventor named Peter Madsen. And she was hoping to interview him. She'd actually been trying to arrange a meeting for several months Kim was in Ref Saloon visiting Olay, and she had hoped to take advantage of being only minutes away from where Peter had his workshop. And she was only going to be there for a couple more days. So it was like in the final moments of like, we got to get this done because I'm off to Beijing. We got deadlines here. Exactly. And it was one of those things like the story didn't have to be done. It would be a great bonus to get it done because then she could get it in a magazine. And I can see you're, you know, you're thinking a lot of things similar, like you think similarly. Like mm -hmm. I'm here. I need to get this done. Let's get it done somehow some way right i mean she's literally minutes away from where peter has his workshop so it was thursday august 10th 2017 and kim and olay had planned a goodbye party that evening they were actually setting up for their barbecue right along the water when kim got an unexpected text from peter he was asking her to tea at his workshop and of course knowing she's days away from leaving she is jumping on it she's stopping what she's doing she's like olay you can take it from here i'm gonna run over there well that lifestyle is is very very much like about the now like when you have an opportunity you must take it because it's not in your control it's these people mm -hmm. that you need access to so if they're giving you access for whatever story you want you know whether it's some breaking news or something like you know you watch the news and the anchor is in like freaking you know afghanistan the next morning or right that it's, night it's they like, just had to jump on a plane yeah there was bombings and whatever it's like oh man they're there it's crazy yeah, so obviously the fact that she's young, she doesn't have children, these are all fantastic circumstances for this kind of lifestyle because she can jump on a whim and go. So she left, she set off to meet Peter. She came back about a half hour later to let Ole know that Peter had actually invited her to go down in the submarine that he basically created. In a submarine? Yes. He had Whoa. built a 40-ton, 58-foot submarine called the Nautilus. I don't know if I'm ever going to get in a self-built submarine. I could, I'd barely get into a professionally built submarine. Not that this guy's not a professional. I'm sure he's very good at building submarines. Probably not. But uh, that that is scary as hell to me. It really scared me. Obviously, I've never been in a submarine, so I was looking at pictures. 20,000 very... leagues under the sea at Walt Disney World. Yeah, that's true. That's I... about two feet under the water. <laughs> yeah, two feet under. So it's just very confining. Um, many people actually wouldn't have taken the story just because of claustrophobia. Yeah. And I'm sure that's a legitimate thing. You know, you're, you're under water so he had built this thing in about 2008 at this point it was 2017 so kim actually came back and she decided to forgo her own goodbye party for the chance for the interview she asked olay if he wanted to join her and he would have had it not been for their pre-planned party well he had friends over he had to entertain them and whatever probably exactly so kim said goodbye olay gave her an extra big kiss knowing that she was going out to sea she told him she'd be back in a few hours the ride was basically set for about two hours Hours, the tentative plan was 7 to 9 p.m. So it was about 7 p.m. when Kim boarded the UC3 Nautilus. She sent Olay a photo of the sub and later a picture of the windmills in the distance, as well as one with her at the steering wheel. When Olay was outside with his friends, he actually saw Kim out in the distance in the water on the submarine, waving towards him. Oh, cool. 90 minutes later, a passing ship happened to take the last photos of Kim alive. Of course. So yeah, you see that coming the, with the submarine. It's mm -hmm. just... She was smiling. She looked relaxed. She was standing on the submarine tower. And I saw these pictures, and she did. She looked very relaxed. It's just so tragic. 
So Peter was well known in Denmark. He was basically like a mini celebrity over there. And Kim was very eager to speak with him, not necessarily even about the submarine, but about a rocket that he had planned to build and eventually launch into space. So as Kim and Peter started to go down in the sub, she texted Olay, I'm still alive, BTW, but I'm going down now. I love you. He brought coffee and cookies, though. This was the last message that would be sent from the sub. Yeah, I imagine you can't send a whole lot out once you're down below. No. So Kim was described as a rock-solid reporter who never made a spectacle of those that she interviewed. Her classmate and friend, Anna Cordrea Rado, told BBC that she was very bubbly and warm, the kind of person who had fantastic stories about the things that she was working on. You could jump, jump straight past the small talk, which I really identified with because I freaking loathe small talk. To me, it's like the worst thing about a party when you're going, when you don't know people. Like, you're you're making these just like, check the box, okay? Yeah, we got to talk. Oh, what do you do for a living? I know I'm telling you and you're not even listening to me. Let's just check the box, okay? I'm never going to see you again. So this is the kind of conversations that I love. Yeah. When you're getting into the meat and potatoes of what somebody does and you're actually learning something. And I, I do a lot of like sales <laughs> trainings just because I'm in sales. I always try to get better at the different things I'm doing. And there's this one guy I follow and he's he's big on just like, stop talking about the weather and stuff. Nobody cares about the weather. Nobody cares about this, what you did this weekend. If you're having a good weekend, they care about the solution you sell. You care about the, their, solving their problems. So let's get to it. Like, let's just push it all past it right and do you ever finish a conversation with somebody and you're like oh my gosh that was so cool like they do this and that and like you learn something so fascinating for sure so it's it's better to get into those deeper conversations yeah so that's what i pictured when this was being said so you know kim had a lot to say she was well traveled she had varied interests she was interested in quirky stories things that were very interesting to talk about it sounds like she had a good like ear for things yes. just like you know if you're interested in something there's a good chance a lot of other people are mm-hmm so if you were at a party, you would end up passing hours just chatting with Kim. So Peter was very familiar with being in the spotlight himself. His life was frequently featured in magazines and on TV reports. He called himself an inventorpreneur and said that his work was to challenge the ordinary. So this was really right up Kim's wheelhouse. She loved talking to people that lived outside the ordinary, something that's different from something what we all do every single day. Mm -hmm. So he was six years old when his parents divorced. His father, Carl, was called a do domineering and violent and physically abusive person. Jeez. He was not abusive towards Peter. He was abusive towards Peter's stepbrothers. So Carl I wonder Madsen, why. I don't know. Was, it's, his, was that his uh, biological father? Uh, it was his biological father. The okay. other three were from other, I think, two different men. Maybe that's why, but I mean, not, never acceptable. Never an excuse. Never. Yeah. So Carl Madsen was 36 years older than Peter's mother, Annie. And after the d divorce, I guess... 36. 36. So... I mean, that's like a lifetime. I mean, unless he was 90 or something, that's kind of sick. So I have no idea what the age gap was, but Annie did have children with two other men. So I imagine that she was probably at least around 30, I would guess. Yeah. So I'm guessing he was in his upper 60s, edging on 70. Sure. Yeah, huge, huge age gap there. You have a lot of money? I Not that I know of. I mean, you can't... I, I don't know. They didn't give a big background okay. on his financial histories. I didn't get his W-2s. I'm not looking for W-2s, <laughs> and not to mention this is in uh, Denmark, so yeah. I don't know if there's W-2s. Oh, okay. So right back at you. Right back at you, bitch. <laughs> so um, after the divorce... It ended up that Peter went to live with his father. I think he may have lived with his mom for a short period of time, but ultimately he went to live with his father. Um, they did share a lot of interests, he and his father. They had a fascination with wars and rockets. Carl made it clear to Peter, though, if you go and visit your mom, do not come back to me, which is so shitty. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of typical for that. You controlling know, yeah typical for controlling and like that old kind of way of doing things you know like if you're a smart parent and you're divorced and you're a significant other that you divorced with is a decent human being at least then you, you they have to have them in their lives mm -hmm. so yeah if you have if you have that stipulation it's super selfish and shitty right and not that i mean not a huge surprise not Carl's a surprise a because he's very domineering and controlling so carl died when peter was 18 again i'm assuming he was an older person being 36 years older than the mother 
At least 36. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Probably exactly. 60s or 70s. So over the next few years, Peter studied engineering, though he changed his course after he felt he had learned enough to move on to build submarines and rockets because that was his end goal. Well, yeah. I mean, why take the rest of it? It's like, I think I got it. Mm-hmm. Okay. See you later. So friends described him as an eccentric person who was not fond of being contradicted. He was an uncompromising person. And you have to remember the person that raised him. I'm sure Carl was very, very similar to this. So others said that his moods could swing between rage and euphoria, which I friggin' hate. When I am seeing somebody and I don't know which side of the coin I'm going to get, I can't stand it. I love it when people are even keeled. You know what you're going to get. Well, yeah. And there's also, you know, mental conditions where people can't control it. I mean, most people don't want to be like that, but it just so happens. I'm sure Peter was just a raging prick. (laughs) So another who worked alongside Peter said that if something didn't please him, he would act like a child who dropped their ice cream. Hmm. When his mood turned, people knew to stay away before stuff started flying he had been a lot of times he'd get his way just because people didn't want to get him started he was an adult having a tantrum yes so people were going to keep him placated so that he didn't get pissed off because if peter was pissed off everybody's day is gonna suck it's it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease sometimes it's sad but assholes get what they want because people don't want to deal with it So at the time, Peter had been married to his wife since November of 2011, though she left him after the events of the story took place and she chose to remain anonymous. So his brother would say that he was his own worst enemy. He would often speak and joke about the Nazis in his workshop. He called his colleague Nazi-inspired nicknames. He would make jokes about injecting battery acid into a person's veins. I don't see how that's funny, that's but really funny. to each their own. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to put battery acid in you. Maybe in this guy's particular community, it was funny. Perhaps. So Peter's interest in submarines and rockets was all consuming, but he definitely made some time in his life for sex. He was a regular at fetish parties. He had a membership to a BDSM club. What kind of fetishes? Um, Obviously, BDSM. is. He a- would come to these parties dressed in like uh, military type outfits. Huh. Okay, it's so, so like role-playing and such, probably. I, yeah, I guess so. Huh. But it was said that he had been kicked out of this BDSM club because he seemed fascinated but not turned on. Oh. So apparently they got the vibe that he was there for the wrong reasons. It's like, uh, I don't see anything going on down there, so <laughs> you better get out unless you can pitch something. Get the hell out. Pitch yourself a tent or get out. <laughs> I don't know the rules of the club, but he wasn't following them. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, just you're just watching. You need to participate. Yeah, and you know, I guess there's different um, places where you can go and like i i don't know this is a, a realm of a world that i am not part of i would think you'd be probably the expert that's how, that's where we met at a bdsm club <laughs> right yeah so there was a person on the radio that would talk about these places where you would go and actually like watch people have sex yeah and there definitely are rules involved because there can be some creepy th- happenings you know when you get that vibe of the guy that's like leering in the corner and you know he's there for the wrong reasons yeah you know, oh, definitely. You want to. You don't want to have people just out there, like, kind of getting their jollies off that. You want them right. like participating, or like they bring their wife, and then you know she's participating, so they can sit and watch. If if you bring somebody, sure. You know, you can't just be by yourself. Yeah, they don't want somebody like a creeper. A woman, I think, is okay, but men that are by themselves yeah. are, are frowned upon. They're basically. like out of here, pal. Because I there's, there's this one guy in the radio here in Tampa that went to some of those. Yes, clubs. that's who I'm referring to. Okay, and he told us a lot about him, and it's fascinating. I, I love learning about stuff that's just, especially you know sex. You learn about sex stuff and it's it's really interesting that there's this whole world going on that you don't even know about completely and that's a conversation i would be interested in hearing about because like you just said it's a world outside my own it's fascinating and i love learning about different cultures and the way people live i don't like to live in a box my 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 own little box is that i don't go to bdsm parties but if you go to it i'd love to hear about it i like your little box <laughs> it's it's nice in here it's cozy yeah there's onesies there's coffee yeah i i like very cushy cozy boxes so if yeah. you want to come on over you'll enjoy it we'll spankings? watch some you enjoy spankings we talked about that <laughs> no before. we don't mike that's in the bdsm box oh right i get those confused but in ours there's vanderpump rules there's a lot of sparkling mineral water happening in my box yeah right very exciting stuff <laughs> very exciting yeah so anyway these these 
clubs are kind of like a bar, like you would come to any other bar, but this everybody knows it's a place for swinging and just kind of sexual exploration. Mm-hmm. And you can give yourself or others or all be part of things. You just all agree on things and then it's kind of leads to another. And they have a back room where you have plenty of like opportunities to do what you will. And lube and all kinds Maybe of Maybe wet stuff. wipes. Yeah, lots of stuff. Yeah. So, so there's obviously got to be moderators and bouncers in these type of situation because where things like this are happening, there's vulnerability and there's the chance for creepers, like you just said, to be around. So obviously somebody was watching him in this club and they didn't like the way that he was being. So he got the boot. So he tended to use his submarine as a way to attract women because obviously not many people can say, I built a submarine. Yeah. A lot of guys say I bought a boat, but it's like, yeah. Hey, hey you ever been in a submarine? So, I mean, that's a good conversation starter. It is. So he definitely used this to his advantage and he would use the line. This is my submarine. <laughs> Do you want to see my submarine? And I'm sure it was like kind Ooh, of like good a, line. He a probably penis thought... joke oh, in a it. way, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. I picture oh, yeah. it being like, I can make anything into a penis joke. Yeah, yeah. you sure can. Yes. Yeah. You know, I do. You're uh, a little immature in that way sometimes. A hundred percent. Absolutely. So women were fascinated by him, and a friend and recent sexual partner had exchanged texts with Peter in which she she just chalked it off as that they were joking. They literally went from this conversation to talking about horses or something. That's how much stock she put in this conversation, that he had a murder plan ready in the submarine. He talked about what tools he would use and that he would cut a woman up. Wow. it was must have been said in such a flippant way that she did not take it seriously. Yeah, maybe they're going back and forth and you know little things, and then he's like, "Well, this is my opportunity to kind of share my idea and mm-hmm. kind of get it out out of your brain." You know, when you have like an idea, you just want to share it, right? Like it's like finally, I can tell somebody, and they're going to think I'm joking, but it's really something. Yeah. So Peter ended up building three submarines during his 30s, and after completing these builds, he moved forward with the idea of space exploration. He partnered with architect Christian von Bungsten, who was a former NASA contractor. The pair planned to form Copenhagen Suborbitals, which was a collective of amateur rocket ma- rocket makers, which I'm sure if you get like a bunch of these guys together, cool things are going to happen because yeah, they all share the same interests and they're very smart. Where the hell is this guy making money? Is he like- So that's my next sentence. Okay. here is it was funded by donations okay so mm. people are donating obviously wealthy people are donating for this crap yes i mean i'm sure it's fine but yeah okay so their goal was to launch a manned rocket into space so in 2014 though their partnership dissolved due to disagreements blamed mostly on peter's behavior in 2014 journalist thomas jersing told a newspaper that peter was angry with god and everyone he has a hard time getting along with other people he has lofty ambitions and wants to do everything his way and when you are that way it's very hard to be in a partnership because it's my way or the highway and it can't be that way when you're in a you know collaboration yeah and he's immature <clears throat> and yeah he's an artist that's all into himself and he yeah that's the only thing he wants if it's not his way then it's it's you know preventing him from making the art that he wants and the 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 tools and the toys that he wants to build so get out of here so he seems like the type of person that's very okay to be around in micro doses but if you're working alongside this guy long term your life is probably going to be hell Mm -hmm. so i'm sure these women were finding him fascinating and they probably were spending about 15 minutes with him and you know what i found a lot of people that i've run into that are like really into themselves as men uh typically like really love sex and last a long time like it, it's how weird. do you know how long they last because the they guys tell talk you about it. yeah exactly They're like man i could do it for like 30 Ew. 40 minutes like you obviously have such poor confidence if you're telling somebody that in conversation and um you know full disclosure i'm not a 30 40 minute guy but well, it's who like, wants to be well, that's get, get in and get the hell out well i'm like that sounds horrible no offense i mean <laughs> after like 10 minutes i'm like okay you're we're gonna wrap bored. this up it's like yeah. come on people <laughs> we, got, we, got, we got things to do today so <laughs> i got vanderpump rules to yeah, watch let's get these things done and then we'll move on yeah exactly have a good time. yeah oh so gosh. It, I, a lot of these guys are so into themselves they're just like you know kind of you picture them like in the mirror like flexing as they're looking you know doing stuff it's like my worst nightmare gross and it's the ones that you're in a conversation with and we're only talking about that person so har- sorry if your husband flexes in the mirror while you're having adult time but um yeah, he might be one of those guys he might be i always say they have Paul, uh, a small penis syndrome. I don't know about that. We don't talk about that as men. You know, it's the guys in the big old trucks that are revving their engines and stuff. I'm like, clearly they have a small penis. Al, 
Allison tells everybody, including our children. Yes, I do. I make sure they know. So Peter moved on to opening at this point, once this relationship dissolved, he moved on to opening a new workshop of his own in June of 2014. He called it Rocket Madsen Space Lab. And this was perfect because it was his name splashed up there. It's exactly he can control the situation. Work by yourself, dude, because that's the only way it's going to be. So it was located in a hangar just across a pave lot from where Copenhagen, excuse me, easy for me to say, Copenhagen suborbitals was. So they basically were very close by. They were neighbors. In 2015, Peter got into another argument, this time with a group of volunteers who were maintaining his submarine because a lot of the work that was being done was happening by volunteers. Yeah, again, I still don't know how much you know, money he's getting because it takes a long time to build these submarines Mm -hmm. and rockets and stuff. And sure there's donations coming in and, or, or, you know, investments, I would say maybe, but I don't still don't know where all this money is coming from. So he's working on the submarine with these volunteers. This is the Nautilus. And he said, you may think that a curse is lying on the Nautilus. That curse is me. There will not be peace on Nautilus for as long as I exist. Cool. It's like, you're an asshole. So as the goodbye party continued that night, Thursday night, when Kim was aboard the submarine and Ole was hosting, party goers moved on to a nearby bar and Ole is checking his watch continuously because obviously the intention was for Kim to go out from about 7 to 9 p.m. 9 p.m. has come, 9 p.m. has gone, and he's, he's worried that she's yet to return. So they planned to get up early for a wedding the next day, and it was absolutely not like him to check in. But of course, Ole knows that she's chasing down the story. Maybe they got into a fantastic conversation. They lost track of time. So at this point in time, he's worried. He's not freaking out. Yeah, still thinking the best. Be like, she's she's got a good head on her shoulders. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, they're in the town where she basically grew up, like nearby. So it's a very safe space. Denmark, from what I understand, has about 50 murders a year. It's a typically safe country. And it's she had been to many places that were very dangerous. So her getting on the submarine of this quirky inventor wasn't really anything that she was all too worried about, except maybe the situation of just going under in a submarine itself. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, they, there's almost no violence there. Yeah, so Ole walked to the pier to wait for Kim, look out in the distance, see if he saw anything. He eventually went back to his room um, where he was staying when he didn't see her. He was not able to sleep. He was just too worried about his girlfriend. He got onto his bike. He rode around the island in search of her. At about 1.45 a.m. in the early morning hours, now on to Friday, August 11th, he officially called the police to report her missing. Yeah, he probably gave himself to like midnight. And yeah. you're like, okay, after midnight, um, I don't think it's going to be this anymore. And then you're like just pushing a little, okay, maybe you're still talking yourself into the positives and you're like, okay, it's 1 a.m. Like, okay, I'm biking around. Maybe I'll see something. I don't, who knows? I'm going to, I don't know. And then it's like, okay, it's, screw it. I'm really worried. 1.45, oh, let's go. I really feel for him because I can't imagine, like you just said you're constantly like okay 15 more minutes just because you're just waiting to see something in the distance oh there she is yeah i knew it but that wasn't happening and then about a half hour later he called in the navy as well because they were right there the the navy was basically stationed there so just before 4 a.m police were notified of a possible accident at a local maritime rescue center soon after helicopters began searching the waters around copenhagen I assume they probably had to wait for morning to come, really, to have better visualization. I mean, I guess you could shine lights down, but... You only see what the light sees. Exactly. So police needed to find out what the hell happened that night in the Orison Strait between Denmark and Sweden, because that's where they were basically heading out. So at around 10.30 a.m., the Nautilus was actually spotted. It was near a lighthouse in Kogi Bay, near a desolate stretch of coastline south of Refsalun. A news report indicated that a man who was out on his boat helping with the search saw Peter in the submarine tower. It was about 11 a.m. and he's watching the situation. He watches as Peter actually goes down the hatch. He re-emerge and the sub just rapidly sinks Mm -hmm. over the course of, say, 30 seconds. So Peter began, he, he got out of the submarine. He began swimming toward a nearby motorboat where he was pulled to safety by four people who were out fishing. He was brought to the port of Dragar, which was, he was met by a group of reporters because people are hearing about this story that this local journalist goes out at 7 p.m. on the submarine. Everybody knows Peter 
And where the hell are they? So already reporters are there. This is big news. Yes. I mean, people were just like, they kept thinking, okay, there's got to be a good explanation for what's going on here. So he was asked, you know, if everything was okay. He turned, he gave a thumbs up to the reporters. A reporter asked him, um, oh yeah, he gave the thumbs up at that point. So he said he was fine. He felt sad that the Nautilus sank. He blamed it on a defect in the ballast or ballast tank, I should say, which is like what helps with the buoyancy of the submarine, you know, because I'm a submarine expert. Oh yeah. I mean, we get, we get a lot of uh, expert uh, certifications Mm -hmm. just doing this podcast. Well, now I'm certified in submarines. So Olay was at the dock where the press had gathered. He knew that something must be terribly wrong because he's seeing only Peter is emerging from the submarine. Where the hell is Kim? Well, and, you know, he's already known a known figure. So everybody's, you know, trying to get his questions and stuff. But it's like, what about my wife? What about the, the my wife was with him and she's not here. Like, let's get to that. Let's right. get this guy in handcuffs or whatever we need to do. Don't let him out of your sight. Oh, man, it sucks so bad. So later that day, police put out a statement indicating that Peter claimed that he had dropped Kim off at about 1030 p.m. the night before near the Helvendet restaurant on the northern tip of Ref Salem. He had not seen her since. This is Peter's version of events. Yeah. The restaurant owner promptly handed over CCTV footage. He said the area is well covered with cameras. We'll see what we see and, and go from there. Awesome. Police did not believe this, so Peter was arrested. And it was a very tricky situation. Wow. So I watched part of this show that was on HBO Max, and I'll talk more about this at the end. But um, you could kind of see the reenactment. And it was, you know... Um, a dramatization of what happened obviously and people were like so wait what you're you're arresting him on, on what because mm-hmm. it was a very confusing situation of like how do we move forward with this yeah in america i don't think he'd be able to be arrested at this point but you know and a lot of nice people from the last podcast they reached out you know on our instagram mm-hmm. was like yeah this is how it's done here and it's it's interesting it's in super countries. interesting to see how people in different countries do different things with the laws yeah right or wrong yeah who knows nobody knows we're so trying to figure it out Peter was charged with involuntary manslaughter, and the the quote beyond this was for having killed in an unknown way in an unknown place Kim Isabel Frederica Wall of Sweden sometime after 5 p.m. The judge ordered that he be held for more than four or for four more weeks. So the point is they wanted to hold this guy because you set out with this girl and now she's not here. Yeah, until we find out what's happened to her. Mm-hmm. And, and since you dropped her off at a place with tons of cameras, hey, listen, buddy, I'm sure you're going to get off scot-free. If your story's right, don't worry. If there's cameras, we'll see her mm-hmm. and then you we're are gonna gone. Be fine. You're, you're gonna, good to go. You're going to be released. Yeah, 48 hours max if your story's right. But if mm-hmm. it's not, you might stay a little longer. So during the time that Kim was missing, her parents wrote a letter to Danish TV saying, Kim has worked as a journalist in many dangerous places, and we have often been worried about her, that something could happen to her in Copenhagen, just a few kilometers from where her childhood home was, we could not imagine at all. And that's just so tragic that their guard was down. Yeah. Their, their daughter was working where she grew up. There's no place she knows better. She felt safe here. Right. It was like never a crossing thought that something would have happened to her. Yeah. So uh, that just makes me sick. So just to give you a little bit of a background about Kim, she was born in 1987. She grew up in the small town of Trelborg in southern Sweden, just across the strait dividing Denmark from Sweden, about 40 miles from Copenhagen. She studied international relations at London School of Economics and got her master's degree at Columbia University School of Journalism. She was at the top of her class. She won honors in her year. She was an exceptional person. I mean, just one of those people that just stands out for success. any group. Always, always doing her best. Mm-hmm. Working her ass off. So after a judicial hearing the next day, August 12th, police were told a new story from Peter that finally emerged on August 21st. Peter said that there had been a terrible accident on board the sub, hmm. and Kim had been accidentally hit on the head by the sub's 150-pound hatch. He said that he panicked and dragged her body out of the submarine and buried her at sea. Ah, oh, what a nice guy. Man. In what realm would you bury a person at sea if there was a tragic accident? None, never, ever, ever. ever. It ever. wouldn't happen. Right. 
But you can't, uh, that's the thing. Like, is it, do you have to get proof that this didn't happen? Like, hopefully, I don't know. Yeah. So he said he buried her at sea somewhere in Kogi Bay, about 30 miles south of Copenhagen. Peter remained. Buried at sea means just putting her in the water. He dropped her body in the water. (sighs) So Peter remained in custody while the police searched for Kim. After the submarine had been raised from the shallow waters where it sank, of course, the um, submarine was being flooded with seawater as it's sinking, sure. which, of course, is going to wash away a lot of evidence. Yep. There were traces of Kim's DNA found inside. Mm. On August 21st, 11 days after Kim boarded the Nautilus, a cyclist was riding along Amar Island, not far from where the sub sank, and came across a human torso that had been washed ashore. Mm. So DNA analysis confirmed that the torso belonged to Kim the following day. An autopsy showed that she had been stabbed 15 times in and around her vagina. Oh, my. <sighs> okay. And so not hit on the head. Obviously. No. So, we'll, well, we don't know. This is a, a torso. Right. This is a torso that's missing a head, arms, her. and legs. Yeah. So we don't know. But it kind of appeared that these stab wounds would not have likely been the cause of her death. They were more, I think, what I read on the superficial side of things. So on Either se- way, absolutely effing oh, disgusting. Just horrible. On September 5th, a court approved the prosecutor's request to change the charge against Peter to manslaughter. On October 6th, police... It's from involuntary to yes, manslaughter. Yes, yes. On October 6th, police divers found Kim's head, her legs, and a knife and clothing. On November wow. 22nd, so yeah, they were combing the bottom of the um, sea. That and, knife is huge. Yeah, so I'll tell you more about what they found. And then on November 29th, they found her right arm. All were in plastic bags. They had all been weighed down with pieces of metal. And it sounds like they were just on the bottom of the sea. What a sick piece of shit. Oh my God, it's just horrible. At this point, Peter continued to deny that he killed and dismembered Kim. How did it happen, buddy? How did it happen? And despite the fact that divers found a saw that was likely used in the actual dismemberment. I mean, I hate all this stuff, but thank God they're finding all these things. And thank God, again, for idiots. Mm-hmm. Thank God for this this dumbass Peter Madsen that's so stupid. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I love when criminals and pieces of shit are so stupid. And, you know, you see the photo of when they pulled him ashore and the reporters were snapping his picture and, you know, he apparently had given that thumbs up. And you're looking at him just thinking like, like what you had just done to this 30 year old girl who just wanted an interview from you who was like who had her entire she was moving to beijing with her lovely partner they were in an amazing relationship she had her whole life ahead of her and you did this all her ambitions gone because you're a sick piece of shit i always look at their eyes and their hands and think like what what did you do it was empty so on october 30th peter changed his story for the third time He said that Kim died on board from now carbon monoxide poisoning. So first he said he dropped her off at the restaurant. Then he said she hit her head on the 150 pound hatch. Now she's dying from carbon monoxide poisoning. So he said when this happened, he was up on deck. It was then that he admitted to dismembering her body. There's no getting around this. She died on your submarine. Her body is dismembered. We found the saw. You cannot deny it any longer. And he realizes this and finally admits to doing so. Good. So I think the reason for the dismemberment, not to like be gross, is that there's only a small like tube that you kind of have to ladder down to get out of the submarine. So I don't think he could dispose of her body in any other way. Right. Couldn't get her up. Yeah. Which is so hard to think about. The whole thing sucks. It really does. So during the trial, which started on March 8, 2018, Peter said that the pressure on board the sub suddenly plummeted while he was on deck. And how convenient. He just happened to be on deck. Yeah. He said that Kim at the time was in the engine room. The sub filled with exhaust fumes and Peter had been unable to get back in. He said that when he was finally able to open the hatch, a warm cloud hits my face and I find her lifeless body on the floor. And I squat next to her and I try to wake her up, slapping her cheeks. The autopsy showed no signs of heat damage to the respiratory system, no signs of gases in the tissue of Kim's lungs. So they're like, nope, try again. It didn't happen. What's your next story, asshole? 
He claimed that for almost an hour, he tried to push her body out of the submarine. And when he wasn't successful, this is when he mutilated and dismembered her. So he's like, I, I just had to. This was a totally normal thing to do. And, you know, just to get her out, I had to do this, unfortunately. I'm and so sad that I did it. The whole thing is, is if this actually did happen and you were on board and all of a sudden there was some sort of malfunction that causes gases to kill her, you would obviously obviously alert the police immediately to tell the authorities what happened her family would bury her or do what they will with her sure you wouldn't mutilate you. her it's body up to you yeah. and, and bury her at sea right. it wouldn't happen so he continued to maintain that he did not murder or sexually assault kim he admitted to dismembering her and disposing her body claiming he initially hid the truth of this whole dismemberment out of respect for the victim's family. Yeah, he's until... He's such a stand-up guy. You mean until the police found her and you were screwed. You had no other choice. Yeah. He said he then planned to commit suicide, sinking the submarine, and then he told the court, in my shock, I thought that it was the right thing to do. But you're a coward. And one article I read indicated that he actually slept next to Kim's body for two hours as he contemplated his next steps. So prosecutors rejected the story. And rightly so. Yeah. During the trial, they painted a picture of a man who liked watching videos of women being tortured and killed. They found these videos on Peter's workshop computer. The night before Kim was murdered, he searched beheading, girl in agony. Shortly before Kim came on board the sub, he had watched a beheading video of a woman who was alive, which was found by police on a hard drive. That's crazy, man. I mean... You know, the internet's used for a lot of good things, but that's that's some bad stuff too, man. There's oh my gosh. Access to anything you can even think of. It's disgusting. They don't know who this woman was. Peter claimed it did not belong to him, and everyone in the lab had access to that computer. Everybody's using that computer. It's not my stuff. Could have been anybody. I mean, I know I'm the only sicko, psych, psychopath, uh, weirdo that's into all this. You know, what I'm mean, into crazy stuff like beheadings. Like that's, that's disgusting. That's where you got to seek help, man. That that's too much. During the trial, prosecutor Jacob Book Jepson said that it was unclear how Kim died, but Peter had brought a saw, a knife, sharpened screwdrivers, straps, zip ties, and pipes on board. Things that wouldn't be on a submarine and things that hadn't been there before. Yeah. He was preparing. He's ready to go. Which sickens me that this innocent girl walked over expecting to have cookies and coffee as she interviewed this sick fuck. And he, in the meantime, has all these tools on board. And to probably promote him, too. So. Of course, yeah. <laughs> because she was writing for, like, very reputable sources. Yeah, you're going to have more people know about you, just like you want. So it's likely that he had bound, beaten, and stabbed Kim before killing her by possibly choking her or cutting her throat. Coroner Christina Jacobson testified that it's likely that Kim's air airway was totally or partially cut off via strangu strangulation, throat cutting, and or drowning. However, the drowning to me would be clear because they would find fluid in her lungs, but it wasn't completely, her like autopsy wasn't completely available. Um, you know, it's hard to say because or she was she, dismembered. Her part, yeah, unfortunately she was in the water for a long time afterwards. Yeah, but there wouldn't be um, water in her lungs had she died ahead of time. Oh, really? It's like... Because mm -mm, it off. would be from inhalation. Oh. So um, they didn't find the typical signs of strangulation, such as blood accumulation in the eyes or abrasions on the neck. But of course, we do know that he, he did cut her neck. She right. was beheaded. Yeah. The stab wounds were determined to occur around the time that there was still blood circulating or just after, despite Peter claiming that he had Kim killed Kim several hours or I'm sorry, he didn't say he killed Kim. He claimed he stabbed Kim several hours after she had died only to allow the gases that accumulate into a decomposing body to release, uh -huh. which they found was not accurate because there was still blood circulating around the time that this happened. Ah, nice. So the Man, coroner, I love how they can disprove everything he's mm -hmm. saying. And they're all lies. Lies, so lies, 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 lies. Yeah. The coroner stated that the wounds were more superficial and wouldn't even have allowed the gases to get out had that been his intention. Well, not to mention, like, we're talking about a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter. It's no, like she's you, gone. You took this poor girl's life. Yeah. She's not here because of you. Yeah. So Kim's partner, Ole, testified that Kim had been afraid to go on the outing in the submarine, but she was so fascinated by people and dedicated to something. So she overcame her fear and she went. Because again, this was the place where she grew up. This was not a challenging case. 
there were many stories that she went to where she was in much more dangerous situations. And I read something last night that some of the most successful people are always trying to push the envelope. When something seems like hard, you should go towards it, like charge towards it. And that's Mm -hmm. where you'll see the most success. Right. Because you're taking the risks that other people, most people are not willing to do. Right. Because we crave safety and predictability in our lives. Yeah. A person who's doing a job like Kim's is the opposite. Right. So traces of Peter's DNA was found on Kim's body and markings of a saw blade were consistent with dismemberment. Her exact cause of death could never be determined. Peter had previously asked other women on board, though they had all declined the invitation. Prosecutors said there was a screwdriver, a saw, a metal piping. They were all brought on board, like I said, for the first time on August 10th as part of a premeditated murder plan to stab his victim, mutilate her, and dispose of her body at sea. Jeez. And then just brush it off as a mistake, an accident that happened, and think that you're going to get away? Like, in the United States, we would probably be like, well, let's let's bring another person on board just in case. But, like, something like Denmark where this stuff doesn't happen. No. It's like it doesn't even enter your brain. We're talking 50, you know, murders a year. Yeah. It's It's not very common. We're not, you know, they probably don't have their guard up like people who live in Chicago might. Right. So a scientist from Danish Technological Institute told the court that Peter's account that Kim died from exhaust fumes was a possibility, but only if the temperature on board had risen very high. But of course, we know that her lung tissue didn't show any signs of this. Um, So on April 25th, 2018, Peter was found guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison. His appeal was denied in September of 2018. But in Denmark, a life sentence averages between 16 to 17 years. Peter can theoretically be released on parole after only 12 years. That uh, doesn't make any sense. And I'm sure, you know, we, I know we have some listeners in Denmark. So if you want to chime in and send us some messages like how this is viewed right now, I'd be fascinated to hear it. But mm-hmm. And uh, what scares me is that this guy will still be very young yeah. if he is released after 12 years. How does life translate to 17 years? I don't know how you could say life when 12 years is just a blip on the radar. He'd be in his 50s or, or so because he was, what, 46 at the time that this happened, about 47 when he went on trial. So he'd be 59 when he potentially got out, very, very healthy and capable of doing other horrific things. Yeah, I'd, I'd love somebody from nearby to be able to chime in. A mental assessment by the Danish Medi- Medico Legal Council has deemed him a narcissistic psychopath with a severe lack of empathy and remorse who poses severe threat to others. Ugh. So it scares the shit out of me that this guy could potentially walk around free. You don't want a whole lot of narcissistic psych- psychopaths that have previously murdered people out on the streets. Because if you think they're capable of doing it again, in fact, somebody just sent me another case idea. Um, I'm, I think it was in Australia. And this horrific person, a serial killer, is on parole for being released this is absolutely somebody who will do it again yes you know there's certain crimes that happen where it's like okay i whatever the situation was they're not maybe likely to do it again i this man scares the hell out of me yeah yeah he can't be trusted so in the fall of 2018 following his conviction peter actually got married to a 39 year old native russian artist named jenny kirpin on december 19th 2019 like yeah can't you do better than marrying somebody who's a murderer of women like it women like you want to marry this dude are you out of your mind Uh, She wrote on her Facebook profile that her husband committed a horrible crime, which he was being punished for. But I am lucky to be with the most beautiful, smart, talented, devoted, and empathetic. Well, I'm sorry. His mental assessment showed that he lacked empathy. So you're wrong right here. I wish I could put $10 million on this marriage not lasting. Like, that would be awesome because then I could make a lot of money on it. You'd be a rich man. Actually, you probably wouldn't make much because the odds aren't great. So it's like you'd make 100 bucks if you put $10 million down on it. It's just disgusting and ridiculous. And the fact that she said he's the most empathetic person and man ever. Maybe she has some problems in her previous life. I can guarantee I would guarantee this girl is not well. Yeah. Uh, My husband is one of the two victims of his crime, and he is staying alive, and this is punishment itself for him. That's very important to remember. Peter Madsen's definitely a victim. Oh, oh yeah, he's a victim. Yeah, go to hell. What an asshole. So she divorced him in early 2022. Oh, look at that. You're rich. Oh, my goodness. I just made 100 bucks in my $10 million bet. Boom. 
So in October of 2020, Peter actually escaped from prison. He was carrying a pistol-like object and good. had a fake bomb strapped to his chest. I say good because this is only to keep him there longer, no, hopefully. No, probably not. Officers captured him less than a mile from prison. I heard it was like a half mile away. It, it was only minutes before they, they caught him. I'm a mad scientist. Look at my bomb on my chest. Asshole. I'm Peter Madsen. I'm an asshole. He was given a 21-month sentence, which will not be added to the life sentence, but may affect future probation applications. Oh, man. This, uh, the, you know, Denmark, there's, it's a place of peace, mm-hmm. you know, so I think that's where it's coming from. Like in the U.S., oh, unfortunately, we're very used to violent crimes this and is, stuff. This is the norm every, over here. Every single day we have uh, mass murders, right. you know, unfortunately, and it's a disgusting thing. But, in, in you know, up there, it's just it's, it's This totally sort different. of thing doesn't normally happen. Yeah, so usually, maybe usually 16, 17 years. They're like, okay, you, you get to settle down. And maybe the, I'm, I'm sure actually that they probably have programs internally in prisons that where you try to help them like, you know, mentally and stuff. Rehabilitate. Whereas here you get slammed into a locker and, you know, forgotten about for right. 100 years. Right. Yeah. So this same year, meaning 2020, Peter eventually did confess to Kim's murder. Finally. Oh, no shit. Finally, he took ownership and it wasn't a, you know, knock on the head, which, of course, we know that the autopsy showed no signs of uh, uh, contusion on the head either. So, so what's he tell the story? I'm so guessing? it was um, the story called The Submarine Killer Confessions of a Murderer. It's a documentary produced by Discovery Networks Denmark. Journalist Christian Linneman asked Peter if he killed Kim when she was on board the sub to interview him and he answered yes it is my fault she died and it is my fault because i committed the crime it is all my fault there is only one who is guilty and that is me so in this um uh yeah that's what your fault means he's an asshole yeah more than 20 hours of conversations were recorded from peter cell and then the thing that i was telling you about hbo made a recreation of events in this case in a six-part series called the investigation um, I watched a couple of episodes. It was, it was really good. Um, Kim's friend, Anna, wants to make sure that Kim is remembered for her work, not for her grisly nature of her death. Kim's parents, Ingrid and Joe, um, I hope I don't say this too badly, Jochim Wall wrote a memoir about their daughter's exceptional life and her murder, recalling the anguish and pain that they experienced in the aftermath of Kim's death. And this book is called A Silenced Voice. A memorial fund has been set up in memory of Kim Wall, the Remembering Kim Wall website, and it was set up on the day that Peter Madsen appeared in court. It was established by family and friends to honor Kim's spirit and her legacy, and it has the goal of raising money, and they hope that it will allow young female reporters to be out in the world brushing up against life, because that's what Kim was doing, yeah. and that's what she would have continued to do had this psychopath not ended her life. Yeah. Very and sad. it's just sickening to think that something like this could happen when she's getting on board and texting her husband or her boyfriend about cookies and coffee, you know, yeah. and granted she made a crack like I'm still alive because she was going down on a submarine, right. not because she thought that this inventor, this quirky inventor was going to kill her. Yeah, you're going down in a box that's below the water. It's it's a fun little joke, but didn't expect to lose your life. So this was just very sad to research. It was just very eerie and just sick and disgusting. Sting. And you can't blame Kim for not taking somebody with her because you want the person to give all the information. You want them to be as vulnerable yes. as possible. So you can't have somebody with you. And she's very confident and courageous and unfortunately 100%. A, a voice that's been silenced by some scumbag piece of shit named Peter Madsen. And these are the, the journalists that get us the stories that, you know, inform us because they're out there putting their, their self at risk. And again, in this situation, she never assumed that her life was at risk. And you do get those stupid people making the comments. Well, she shouldn't have gone down with him alone. Because it's so easy. I can't stand these internet troll dipshits, man. It's so easy to shit on somebody. Like, how about let's lift people up? Right. I mean, well, let's shit on Peter Madsen because he's a we- he can shit. crop his name through the mud in his mouth in his mud he, he can eat shit for the rest of his life yeah. because he's a monster right but the fact that this innocent girl was just doing a quirky story about a man who had made submarines and was moving on to make rockets how do you like how do you get out of that like oh she should have brought somebody with like that's your Shut takeaway the hell up that's your takeaway from this like, like you have these thoughts in your head keep them quiet don't get to your keyboard or your texting on your phone like and again, I will say, like, when you read reviews or comments on people's Instagram, TikTok, whatever, 
It amazes me that other humans could be so downright nasty to other humans that they don't know. Yeah. It, it, it amazes me. Like, what kind of hurt and is bubbling inside of you that you could be so mean to somebody you don't know? That's a whole other episode. But it is, but it's yeah. just a side note. Yeah. And anyway, that is the horribly tragic and disgusting murder of Kim Wall. And it's just tragic. Well, thank you for helping remember, Kim. And, um, you know, what I want to say is if, you know, you appreciate the research Allison does into these. And I got I got next week. So listen, folks, if, if you hate my voice, you're going to hate next week. But we'll, it'll be an interesting one. Um, we have more options. So if we've got 22 episodes that you can't access unless you're a Patreon of the Crime and Coffee Couple Club. Mm -hmm. So come on over. And I want to say welcome to some of our newest club members. We've got Elena, Lisa, Brittany, and Amanda. And, um, you know, they are from a couple of them, I think, are from nearby Denmark. Well, um, this story was a listener suggestion from Elena. Oh, was it? Okay, cool. Yes. Well, hey, awesome. And uh, just so you know, we take our listener suggestions from our patrons way number one. So, you know, if you want yours really to be told, come on over to Patreon. So. We, that's not true. No, we, don't. We, we have equal opportunity yes. over here in the Crime and Coffee Couple Club. That's true. That's true. But hey, it helps, right? So, um, yeah, Denmark, I'm sure if you guys have any information about this, like, please send it over and let yeah, us know. Yeah, you know, the whole idea of how could a life sentence equate to, on average, 16 to 17 years and in peter's case could he could be out as soon as 12 years and does that frustrate people in, in i these mean countries? i would imagine so yeah so. the fact that you know he could be less than 60 years old and be very capable of committing much more you know craziness in the world yeah so go check out the show notes become a patron and uh, we'd love to shout your name next week absolutely and until next time bye, bye.